So in this episode of Economics Detective, I'm going to take you through what to expect uh, as you're starting in your four-year econ degree. So stay tuned. So this episode is about what to expect in an undergraduate degree in economics. I can speak to uh, the vast majority of North American economics undergraduate programs uh, because they're all very similar. There, there tends to be a consistency in the way undergraduate economics is taught, at least in North America. Um, and I, I guess uh, the, the rest of the world tends to follow suit with us as well, but uh, I can't speak to them as well. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about my background. I'm a PhD candidate in economics, in a Canadian economics program, which means I went through a four-year undergraduate degree and then a master's degree and now half of a PhD. So, uh, I mean, all three are at Canadian universities. They're at different universities. Um, so I can speak to uh, this from the perspective of someone who was an undergraduate student and then who TA'd many courses as a master's student and as a PhD student. And at three different universities, there was a great degree of consistency between these. So uh, I think what I'm going to say is going to probably apply to you if you're, if you're studying economics in Canada or the United States. So microeconomics is the foundation of economics. Uh, it starts from the, the sort of preferences and constraints faced by consumers and firms. Um, first year micro tends to be, uh, you know, tends to want to get you to the point of understanding supply and demand. So like you, you want to work up to the point where this graph, you know, you have the two blades of the scissors, an upward sl sloping supply curve, a downward sloping demand curve, and you can say, uh, you know, you can manipulate that and you can uh, understand what's going to happen if, you know, you, there's a shock to that, if, you know, the, the supply, there's a sudden upward shock to supply, you know, you can say what's going to happen to price, and uh, that typically want you to understand the foundations of that model. It's a very sort of central model in economics, and it's used it, you know, from the very first undergraduate course to, you know, advanced seminars. Um, it, it's just sort of in the back of everyone's head, right? Um, uh, first year, you typically do not have a calculus requirement for your first micro course, which makes things a little difficult. Uh, because, of course, if you don't have a calculus requirement, you, you don't have the mathematical tools to solve for a lot of the, uh, the results that you're going to be studying. So, for instance, um, in a uh, first year micro course, you might just be told that, uh, you know, the equilibrium is at the point where the marginal rate of substitution equals the price ratio. Um, but that's just sort of going to be told to you. Uh, it's just like, this is how it is, kid, uh, deal with it. Um, and the issue with that is that, uh, you know, you, you just, you just need to sort of take it on, on faith. They'll, they'll give you a co sort of common sense explanation about why that's the case, but you're not able to actually solve the model yourself. So, um, that's first year. Uh, so second year you're going to learn second year micro. Typically you learn the same things you learned in first year micro, but now with calculus. So, um, you know, you, you got your supply and demand, but you also, uh, are going to figure out how to solve a, a utility maximization problem subject to a budget constraint, um, using the tools of, of calculus, just, uh, uh you know, uh, essentially just derivatives, just the, you know, basic derivatives, um, that you learn in, in a first year calculus class, or maybe that you even learned in high school. It's just, they weren't required for first year. Um, and of course you'll learn the theory of the firm as well, both first year, second year, this again, moving from, uh, not needing, uh, calculus to needing calculus, uh, firms under perfect competition, trying to, uh, and you'll you learn the sort of logic of why um, price the price of good converges to its marginal cost. 
Uh, second or third year, you also ex you'll expand on that theory of the firm to learn about monopolies. Um, and uh, and in, in third year, definitely you you learn about um, uh, sort of models of competition that are sort of derived from more game theoretic things, uh, Bertrand competition, um, and uh, and so that and and the logic of of um, companies maximizing profits when they have some effect on the price, uh, although it may be strategic if there's a small number of firms. Um, as you get into, yeah, third year, you'll, you'll, you know, add more to your sort of knowledge of, of consumer theory as well. Uh, you learn how to break down income and substitution effects again with calculus. Um, and, uh, and this is where it might diverge depending on your program and depending on what electives you take, but you could learn, you could pick up some game theory, uh, learn about some choice under uncertainty, uh, expected utility maximization, um, and, uh, may maybe pick up some, some signaling theory market for lemons. Uh, so game theoretic things, this is, this sort of gets into, you know, stuff that, you might learn in an advanced undergraduate course, or you might have to wait till your master's degree, assuming you get a master's degree, um, for this sort of really cool, fun, uh, macro, or I mean, sorry, uh, game theoretic stuff. And speaking of macro, let's, uh, let's move on to that. So macroeconomics, again, I'll start from first year and, and move on. Um, Macroeconomics deals with uh, the the whole economy rather than just the decisions of individual um, consumers and firms. Macroeconomics at the academic level. So in the in the nineteen seventies nineteen eighties, they there was a, a pivot towards micro foundations. So macro models today look a lot like micro models. The distinction is sort of getting less and less uh, important in academic circles. But th the funny thing about macroeconomics is that, uh, at least taught at the undergraduate level, is that you're going to learn a whole lot of models from the 1960s. Um, it's not super clear to me that uh, that uh, that's super useful, but uh, it is what it is. So um, one important uh, model you'll learn is the solo growth model. Uh, I mean, this is a diagram from it. Don't expect you to under understand it just from looking at this. But, um, you know, the idea is uh, it's an economy that is growing, uh, maybe at a stable uh, growth rate, or maybe it's growing to towards an equilibrium, converging to an equilibrium as, as people save and it builds and the economy builds up capital and the marginal product of that capital falls until the point where it's, uh, you're just, uh, replacing your capital with your, your depreciated capital with your savings. So it's a, a model of, of convergent growth. Um, then you might expand on that to some, uh, some other growth models, uh, Romer, uh, growth models where, where technology matters. There's going to be, there's a lot of, um, ex exponential functions in this. So, uh, I guess the, the fact that's going to be coming up over and over again is, is, or that you're going to be seeing a lot of E, um, you know, to continue for equations for continuous growth and, um, you should, and there'll be some, you know, basic calculus in there and, uh, and growth equations. Um, so that's solo. Uh, the other thing that um, you're going to be learning a lot of in your um, macro courses is uh, Keynesian macro models from the 1960s, by which I mean ISLM uh, and a AD may be thrown in there. Um, nobody uses these anymore except maybe Paul Krugman uh, in his New York Times column. So I guess you'll understand Paul Krugman's New York Times column really well. Uh, you know, they, they might actually, I shouldn't say no one, they might come up in, in policy sometimes, but, uh, the sort of, um, modern macroeconomist 
doesn't typically work with ISLM. That's again, something from the 1960s. It's not micro founded. Um, and it, uh, you know, it's just sort of, it's detailing the relationship between the central bank and output and employment. Um, and then, uh, you know, uh, and in a sort of mechanistic way where, okay, this moves and that moves. Um, it's not based on individual consumer choices. It's based on, uh, sort of the observed movements of, of aggregate variables, um, so, you know, you can see why this isn't super popular at, at the more advanced levels, but we teach it to you as sort of a baseline, I guess. Um, as you get into advanced third and fourth year classes in macro, um, you might see uh, labor market stuff. And, you know, at, at the at the fourth year level, de I've definitely seen profs teach search theory, which very much is at the forefront of modern macroeconomics so you you might learn that search theory is uh the theory where um instead of us all you know reaching an equilibrium uh, immediately and instantaneously i need to you know if i want a job i need to go around and i'm randomly paired with firms and then maybe a job is created and maybe it isn't um and you know this sort of the math mathematization mathematization of that, uh, you know, of your, your experience looking for a job. Um, and that's a, a much more, um, modern and, and, uh, important, uh, model to learn that you might pick up later on in your, um, undergraduate career, depending on who your prof is. So econometrics is uh, going to be the hardest uh, of the of the three main subjects you study as an econ major, um, but it's also the most important. It's also the one that eventually gets you a job in the private sector if if you know if you're into that. Um, in your first year, you probably don't take any econometrics courses. You probably just take uh, linear algebra. Um, you learn a lot about how to, you know, matrix matrices, how to multiply matrices and, and vectors, um, how to invert them, what it means to invert a matrix. Um, so just sort of the, these uh, mathematical baseline things that are necessary for statistics. Uh, you, you might first or second year take an intro st to statistics course, uh, maybe not even from the economics department, maybe from the math or stats department. Um, but, you know, third year is when you really get into econometrics and the model that, or the, the model in this, in this case, it's a different kind of model. It's a statistical model for, for estimating, um, relationship between variables, but the, the model that's going to be really important, uh, to you is ordinary least squares. So, you know, it's, it's a way of, of taking, um, you take, a, a dependent variable, uh, maybe someone's income, and then you you t you uh, chart that as a function of several independent variables assumed to be independent, like how many years did they go to school, um, you know how old are they, uh, how how much work experience do they have, um, and uh, maybe what 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 was their parents' income. Um, you know, are they male or female? It was just a one for male or, and a zero for female or vice versa. And then, um, and then what ordinary least squares is, is fitting a line to that equation, you know? So, so if we were going to assign, uh, numbers, weights to all of those independent variables, you know, how much would they then determine or, you know, how would they relate to, um, income or, or dependent variable. And then of course there'd be an error term. And I think if I ran that particular regression, um, the, it would probably have a, a fairly low R squared. Um, it would, it would probably not explain a lot of people's income, particularly, uh, because I didn't, uh, specify taking logs anyway, that's, and cause labor, labor markets and income are, are particularly, I, I'm getting off on a tangent here, but the important thing is you're going to learn about ordinary least squares and you're going to be asked to use your linear algebra skills from first year 
to prove all sorts of things related to them, like, uh, you know, ordinary least squares is the best linear unbiased estimator um, for when you have uh, when you have data that that obeys certain um, properties, uh, certain certain fairly unrealistic properties. You're probably going to have to prove uh, how um, ordinary least squares goes wrong in all sorts of situations when you when you say have um, uh, uh, correlations between your your variable your dependent variables and your or your and your independent variables and your error term and so uh, you know your your underlying assumptions don't hold you're going to have to show exactly using uh, linear algebra proofs exactly why um, your your underlying assumptions don't hold and why ordinary least squares is no longer the best linear unbiased estimator um, when you uh, when you violate one of its underlying assumptions. Um, if, if you don't understand all these words that are coming out of my mouth, trust me, uh, you will, <laughs> but, uh, but it may take you a while. Um, it's quite difficult, uh, but the other element of econometrics is the applied side. Uh, most programs, or vast majority of programs, will will teach you how to use some some statistical package to uh, run regressions and apply different statistical models, um, especially ordinary least squares, um, in, in at least in your first econometrics class. Um, and so you might use something like Stata or eViews or hopefully R. R is open source and it's great, very well documented, um, and, and uh, and you'll you'll learn that, and you'll learn how how to uh, plug data into a computer, and and uh, and run a statistical model, and get back the result, and then interpret it, which is of course much easier than the um, the sort of mathematical proof side of uh, asymptotic theory, or or um, of you know proving that so, some model is unbiased under certain. Uh, assumptions uh, that the theoretical econometrics is super hard you just have to sort of uh, b bite your tongue and, and get through it um, but the applied stuff is not so hard you know especially if you're a little computer savvy you know if you've ever uh, I don't know programmed a website or, or something and you just uh, you know you use computers for something other than games <laughs> um, you, sh you should be fine with that although of course you know uh, a lot of it is um, writing a hundred lines of code and then uh, searching desperately for the one missing semicolon that makes it not work. So have fun with that. Um, once you graduate, you will either uh, then apply for a graduate program and <laughs> start the cycle all over again, um, or uh, you, you might apply for a job in the private sector, in which case most likely it'll be your econometrics, statistics skills, your ability to use that software um, to, to look at data. Um, that'll get you your first job in, the, uh, in government or private sector. But, that's, but data analysis is what people really need and what companies and, and governments and you know, everyone in the world needs from you. Uh, probably all that stuff about finding a unique equilibrium um, given a utility function and a budget constraint is not super important, but it's kind of, it's good for you. It's good for you to know that. And I, you know, it can be useful. It can be useful, but uh, no one's, no one's going to hire you on the basis of that if you can't also do statistics. So that is uh, my rundown on what to expect in an undergraduate degree in economics in a North American school. Uh, if you are planning on doing that, I wish you the best of luck. And, um, you know, you can leave a comment uh, on this video if you have any questions. Mm -hmm.